history of the early church. Welcome to the class. This is going to be an exciting 10 hours. We're going to be talking about all kinds of information. And if you would begin by opening up to the table of contents, we're going to be looking at an overview of uh, the course. And also, each one should have the textbook, Lasting Legacy, the Church. We'll be talking about the first few hundred years of the early church. You can see in the table of contents what we'll be covering. Uh, lesson one, we'll be looking at Christ and the Apostles. That'll be this first hour. Lesson two, the Apostolic Fathers. Lesson three, the Apologists. Lesson four, the Early Theologians. Lesson five, Emperors, Popes, and Social Change. Lesson six will be a fun one. We'll be talking about everyday Christian living. Uh, lesson seven will be into miracles, missionaries, monks, and movements. That's the four M's. Lesson eight, uh, we'll be looking at the later theologians of the East and West. Lesson nine, we'll be talking about controversies, the councils that happened and the various creeds that were created in early Christendom. Lesson ten, we'll be talking about lessons, legacies, and fables from the past. And if you turn over now to the course syllabus on page four, uh, we see the course description there. This is a history of the early church spanning from its origin to the Council of Chalcedon in A.D. 451. And now if you skip down to the course objectives, these are the things that I'm hoping that each of the students will be able to take from this course. Uh, A, provide general knowledge of the growth and changes in early Christian in the early Christian church. B, cite examples of early Christian beliefs, practices, controversies in comparison to the various modern day issues that arise. Uh, letter C, explain similarities and differences of notable people and movements. Uh, in the book, actually, profile about 80 different personalities from the, from the early church. So it's, it's a good read, gives a lot of information. Uh, letter D, to distinguish between the doctrines of the Eastern and Western churches. Letter E, to contrast factual history with revisionist fables. We'll be looking more at that concept. And letter F, to categorize and evaluate the overriding motifs of the early church. Now let's go ahead and skip over to uh, page 10, and that is lesson one, entitled Christ and the Apostles. And I'd like to begin with a, with a word of prayer. Father, I just come before you and I thank you for each one here that is watching this live. And Father, for those that are watching this in various uh, video uh, and DVD uh, modems. And God, I just pray that you will just increase our wisdom, give us understanding and uh, just ability to uh, know the early church history, to be able to use this information uh, in a way that is fitting and useful for your kingdom. God, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives, and we pray that this will be a blessing, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at the beginning of uh, the top of the page, there's a quote there by Philip Schaeff. He said, In Jesus Christ, a preparatory history, both divine and human, comes to its close. In him culminate all the previous revelations of God to Jews and Gentiles, and in him are fulfilled the deepest desires and efforts of both Gentiles and Jews for redemption. But as Jesus Christ thus closes all previous history, so on the other hand he begins an endless future. He is the author of a new creation, the second Adam, the father of regenerate, regenerate humanity, and the head of the church. Those are famous words by the historian Philip Schaeff. I have kind of a, a fun and hu uh, story to, to share with you about a nun who actually was in a car. She, she worked for a nursing home, and she, she broke down on the side of the road. And she didn't have, uh, uh, she ran out of gas, rather, and she didn't have anything to get gas with. And, and so she looked around in the back of her car, and, and she didn't see a, anything to carry gas in, she found this old bedpan. She, she walked down to uh, the gas station and she filled up that bedpan with gasoline and she hiked back to her car and she was just pouring that gas into uh, her car when these truck and the one motioned to the other one and saw the nun pouring that gas into her car and he, and he said, now that's real faith. 
he didn't realize what was in the bedpan. So, you know, when you look at the early church, these were people of extraordinary faith. And uh, that's who we're going to be studying. But some people might ask, why study the, the early church? Why study the early church? Well, there's several reasons. Now, for those of you that have the syllabus, you're going to be marking down what's in the red there. Those go in the blanks in your, in your syllabus. And so to give the believer stability and roots. So write down the word stability in the blank in your syllabus. Uh, we see that it says in Psalm 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? We as Christians need to have solid understanding of what happened in the early church. I'm just amazed today that people just kind of live their lives out in Christianity and they just kind of base it upon what other people said. But then when the attack comes, we don't really have substantial information to refute the, the attack. And if we simply study it out a little bit, we can do a much better job. So number one is just to give the believer stability and roots. Number two is to liberate us from the limited view of the present. Sometimes we seem to think that all of the problems that we're facing in Christianity in here before. But in reality, the church has faced them over and over and over again. And if we can become better knowledgeable of what was said, what people wrestled with in earlier times, then we might have a better chance today of understanding the things that we're facing and to wrestle those things in a better way. Number three, it is to understand the Lord Jesus Christ better. When we understand the early church, the roots, the history, the origin of the church better, we have a better concept of our Lord and Savior. In the time that he lived and uh, the commissioning that he gave to his disciples and all of the things that took place, they make us understand him better. Uh, number four, to learn to defend the development of Christian doctrine. There's a lot of doctrine out there today. And how did it get there? Why do people believe the way they do? Well, when we look back at the roots of the early church, we can gain some understanding. And uh, this 10-hour course, there's so much in the early church. And, and during that time frame, this 10-hour course can only be like a like a primer, uh, a beginning study for somebody who's highly interested. But I'm going to be giving you a lot of information. Uh, you don't need to write it all down, but certainly whatever is in the red, write down. And um, there's also a lot of other information in the book. But other things uh, is to debunk myths in revisionist history. Now, I'm going to be talking about the Da Vinci Code in the 10th hour, re refuting that. I was in. Uh, Europe last year, I was invited over there to three different nations to uh, refute the Da Vinci Code when it came out, the myth of that. I was even in a university setting uh, refuting it, and in various churches around France and, and Belgium and uh, Holland. Uh, very exciting. I was in different places refuting it. But you know, there's a lot of people today trying to reinvent what happened in the early church. Uh, they can't just accept the facts for being the facts or, or the truth that is the truth. They want to try and rewrite history. They want to put their spin on it because they can't simply buy into Jesus being God and rising from the dead and all of those types of things. Uh, one very recent example uh, happened just this year. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the Jesus coffin. Uh, the Titanic director, James Cameron, told the world on February 26th 2007 that one of these two coffins is that of Jesus and the other one is that of Mary Magdalene and he went on to say that they together had a son of course uh, now that's completely different than the than the daughter that supposedly uh, they had um, uh, according to the uh, Da Vinci Code however when you when you look at uh, uh, Cameron's claims historians and scholars point out numerous problems with his claim uh, archaeologists disagree with him. Even the Jewish archaeologists that actually discovered the site and the coffins themselves say this is not the coffin of the famous Jesus. Uh, in those days, one out of ten people were named uh, Yeshua, and one out of four were named Mary. So there were Jesus and Marys married all over the place. Um, no historian, early or otherwise, ever wrote uh, about Jesus' coffin, the famous Jesus. If Jesus had actually been buried or in a coffin, his enemies would have used that uh, to refute the, the early uh, truth that went out about his resurrection. And the question, why would Jesus' followers bury him and then proclaim that he rose from the dead? 
and then go on to suffer martyrdom for decades and centuries afterwards. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, and then just a few miles away down the road is, is the place where, where Christian pilgrims have been visiting for centuries and thousands of years, the empty tomb of the risen Christ. So really, there's, there's no proof, and, and uh, it, it's not true what they are saying, because Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, okay, what is the time frame that we are looking at if you, uh, if you consider the early uh, church time frame? Uh, the periods of history can kind of seem forced, mechanical, they can be unconnected. There's, there's, there's a problem in creating you know, certain periods, early church, middle church, later church, because they kind of you know, cross over boundaries and, and things of that nature. But uh, just for sake of, of understanding the concept, uh, many theologians say that, they, that it is from the days of Christ to the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD, or you can see in your notes there at the top of page 11, that some push it all the way to the time of Pope Gregory the Great in AD 590. Now let's talk about the evidence for Jesus Christ. Well, the Christian writers and historians, uh, starting with the Gospels, the history of the book of Acts and the epistles, all the way through the writings of the early church fathers and later historians, we see much evidence for the life and times of Jesus Christ. One example would simply be to open up the Bible today. Uh, in it we see things like uh, Galatians, which was written around 49 AD, and first uh, epistle of the Thessalonians, written maybe between 49 and 52 AD. Uh, these were written just a couple of decades after the time of Christ, and they substantiate the things about the life of Jesus, as well as the doctrines firmly established within just a few years, really, after the ascension of Christ. Uh, another thing we could look at are, would be the miraculous expansion and impact of early Christianity in a world full of idols and false gods, which this gives strong evidence uh, verifying Christ and his teachings, the miracles that happen. Uh, we could also look at some of the early non-Christian references. For instance, Josephus. He lived between 37 and 100 AD, and he is considered uh, by many to be uh, one of the most accurate historians of all time, especially of that era. He was a Jewish historian, and he became a Pharisee at, at 19 years of age. In AD 66, he was the commander of the Jewish forces in Galilee. After his capture, he was attached to the Roman headquarters. He wrote this about Christ. He said, now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. This is amazing. This is a Jewish historian writing this. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as had a veneration for truth. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. Wow, that's amazing. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared unto them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had spoken of these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him, whence the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. We could go on to look at Cornelius Tacitus, uh, who was a Roman historian and the governor of Asia in 112 AD. He says, uh, he, in, in his letter to, um, who is he writing to? In his, in, his, uh, in his, regarding Nero, he says, he falsely charged with the guilt and punished with the most exquisite tortures the persons commonly called Christians who were hated for their enormities. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. So even the outside Christian sources understood that Jesus had lived and died at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Uh, under number three there in your notes, uh, Plinus Secundus, known as Pliny the Younger, he was the governor of Bithynia in Asia Minor for a while. And he wrote to Emperor Trajan, uh, explaining that he had been killing Christians, both adult and children. And so he was seeking advice about how many Christians he should kill. And he wrote, 
They affirmed, however, that the whole of their guilt or their error was that they were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verse a hymn to Christ as to God and bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, adultery, never to falsify their word, nor to deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. So we see the morality of Christians here in the early church. They were a very moral people. Other sources, uh, you can read through that on your own. Okay, moving along, uh, look at the birth of the church. We see, for instance, under number one, uh, the, the life of Christ. He was called Emmanuel, the Son of God. Uh, Matthew 1.23 says, Behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Under letter B, uh, he called and trained his disciples. Write Matthew 10, uh, 2 through 4 there, Matthew 10, verses 2 through 4 in your notes. We see in this portion, uh, he actually calls the disciples. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Labaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And so we see the twelve right there. Jesus died on the cross, Matthew 27, 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. But he didn't just die on the cross, he was buried and then he rose from the dead, hallelujah. Mark 16, 9, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. He rose from the dead and he changed history for all time. Everything changed. We just celebrated Easter here a few weeks ago. And why? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead and life will never be the same again, praise God. Uh, there was the promise, uh, oh, excuse me, there was the great commissioning uh, after he rose from the dead in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Can you imagine being one of the disciples, one of the 500 that saw Jesus ascend into heaven, just standing there on that hill and watching him go up and, and to know that this great commission had been given to go to the nations. Well, as we study out the lives of the apostles, the disciples, and the early church, we're going to see they did just that. You can see the promise uh, of the Holy Spirit in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. The day of Pentecost, you can read about that in Acts chapter 2. And, uh, and then you can read the Acts of the Apostles. Now, looking at the Apostles, the, the facts, the traditions, and the legends, if you have your textbook, would you please open it up to page 6. And I'm going to be referring to the textbook throughout my time here. And so just kind of have that handy because we'll be looking at it. I'll be reading portions of it because it's a lot easier. Plus. There's so much information, I don't basically remember it all. But at the bottom of page six, it talks about facts, traditions, and legends. Uh, it says, an historical fact is one that can be verified and has been accepted as true history. Traditions are beliefs or customs handed down. These are considered more reliable than legends, which may be the enlargements of traditions and hold certain aspects of truth. Myths have much less likelihood of any truth. So what I want you to get down here is that there's, we're dealing with four different words. There are facts. Facts go on the very top. They are, they are verified. They are true. But then underneath them, there are traditions. Traditions are, they've been around for a long time, and they're certainly based upon something. Something happened that caused that tradition. And so they could be fact. But then underneath tradition, there is legend. Legend is not as, as uh, stable as, as tradition. Uh, it maybe is based upon some truth, some element of truth, but maybe not. And then underneath that is myth. Myths are most likely not true. 
But as we go into the lives of the apostles, what I'm going to be giving you are some of the, some of the legends, some of the myths, but also, of course, the facts and the, the traditions of them. So don't try to write all of this down. I would simply put down your pens and, and, and simply try to enjoy what I'm going to be explaining to you here in the next few minutes. I will be moving through these quickly for sake of time because I'm, I'm going to be covering a lot of territory. You can read the books and get more information than what I'm presenting here. But when you look at Andrew, the brother of Peter, he introduced Simon to Christ. We find this account in uh, John 1, uh, verse 40 through 41. He ministered in Ephesus, uh, Scythia, and Greece. Now, Scythia is mentioned in Colossians 3.11. It was in the southern Russia on the Black Sea. So he went as far as the Black Sea in Russia. In Greece, he angered the proconsul Agiats, whose wife, Maximilla, was won to Christ by Andrew. So the wife was won, but not the husband. And that caused a conflict. Uh, imprisoned, and then he was then crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece in 69 AD. You can see in the picture the X-shaped cross that, that he holds. That's, that, re, that refers to um, St. Andrew. Uh, a Christian named Regulus in the 4th or 5th century carried some of Andrew's bones to Scotland and buried them there. Why he did that? I don't know, but he did. And so today, patron, he is the patron saint of Greece and of Russia and of Scotland. Three different nations claim Andrew as their patron saint. When we look at Bartholomew, uh, he ministered in Armenia, Hierap Hierapolis, and India. He preached with Philip in Hierapolis, but he escaped martyrdom there. Philip did not. Uh, in 60 AD, as a matter of fact, let me slow down here. There is, there is a, a legend that actually they had Bartholomew up on the cross with uh, Philip. And that uh, for whatever reason, he was actually released and Philip was not. And Bartholomew went on from there. In 60 AD, Bartholomew joined Thaddeus in Armenia. Uh, Bartholomew healed the lunatic daughter of the king. And in 68 AD, pagan priests had him tortured, and this is an ugly thing, had him filleted alive. They, they little, literally ripped his skin from off of his flesh, and then they crucified him. He, he suffered one of the most painful deaths of, of any of the martyrs, uh, excuse me, any of the apostles. He is the patron saint of Armenia. Uh, James the Elder, the, the brother of John, he, there is a disputed tradition about him in Spain. And uh, as prophesied by Christ, he did drink of the cup that Jesus did. Uh, remember, he and John were walking beside Jesus, and, and uh, they were, uh, their mom was involved, and they wanted to know which one, was, you know, if they could sit on either side of him in, in heaven. And, and Jesus challenged them and said, are you, you know, can you drink this cup that I that I drink, and they said, yes, we can, and, and um, well, uh, he certainly did. Now, he was not the first martyr. Does anybody know who the first martyr was? Stephen. Stephen, that's right. Stephen was the first martyr. He was a deacon, right? And then there were, there were other martyrs as well. You can read about those in Acts 26.10, or Paul refers to uh, other martyrs in, in Acts 26.10. Uh, in Acts 12, 1 and 2, we see that James uh, was the first martyr of the apostles. He uh, was beheaded by Herod uh, on Passover, which would have been Easter in 44 AD. The, there's a tradition that the man who led James into Herod's court was so moved by James' testimony that he confessed himself also to be a Christian, and both were led away to be beheaded. So this guy actually came to, to take him to his death, but he was so moved by, by the testimony of, of James that, that he said, yes, I'm a Christian too, and so he was taken away to be martyred as well. There's James the Younger, the brother of Matthew. Uh, there is possibly some physical similarity to Jesus. That's one of the legends. Another legend is that James took the vow of a Nazarene. 
He drank no wine, ate no meat except the Paschal lamb. He never shaved, uh, cut his hair, or bathed. Um, but this is, is highly refuted and not in sync with the other apostles. So, you know, it's, it's probably not true, but there, there is a legend regarding that. You know, he was kind of like a hippie of those days. No, no bath, anything like that. Um, would have been a friend of mine, you know, back in the Jesus people days. So, uh, uh, first, he was the first bishop of the Syrian church in Jerusalem. And he was probably stoned... Uh, by the Jews for preaching. So that's James, the younger brother of Matthew. Now John, the brother of James, he had a ministry in Ephesus. He was the pastor in Ephesus. Uh, he went to Patmos uh, where he received his revelation. He was in Rome and in Parthenia. And of course, uh, he was the author of the, of the uh, gospel and of John, uh, excuse me, the Gospel of John. He was also the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. He took care of Jesus' mother. Uh, Jesus assigned uh, his mother, uh, so to speak, to John, to his care. And so she lived with him in, in uh, Ephesus. Uh, Eusebius, the early church historian, says that John was exiled to Patmos during the reign of Domitian, but was released in 96 AD. On Patmos, he received and wrote the Revelation. And uh, again in Ephesus, he ministered and became the leading voice of the church until his death around 100 AD. So he outlived all the other disciples, all the other apostles, and uh, this would have been during the reign of Trajan, who, who uh, reigned from 98 uh, to 117. John's tomb still stands there today, but his relics are gone. His bones are gone, and all of his belongings are gone. But the tomb is there. Uh, apparently, when he would preach as an old man, he would get in front of all of his disciples that, would fo that followed him. And we're talking about thousands of people there. And he would get up, and usually his preaching was very short. And, and he would simply say, little children love one another. And they would, the, the disciples would get a little bit perturbed and say, you know, Pastor John, won't you, won't you say something else to us? Won't you, won't you preach this? And he, and he would simply say, if you do this, you have done everything that is necessary. You know? and so that's, that's one of the things that was written about him. He lived until around 100 AD. Eusebius tells an amazing story about John. He tells of a time when John was was old, he was aged, and he had led a young man to the Lord who had backslidden and had become a thief and lived among robbers in the hills in a cave. And he learned about it, and so he took one of the horses and he rode out to this cave. And as he entered as he entered the cave, uh, some of the some of the robbers, the bandits, came up and and uh, he said, I, I want to see this, this young man. This young man ended up being the leader of the bandits. And um, as he got near, uh, the, young, the, the man recognized him and started running uh, from John. And, and John called out to him and said, don't run from me. I'm your father. Why are you running from me? And, and uh, it, it is said that the, that the young man uh, was baptized the first time in water, and he was baptized the second time in his tears. And he just, he just gave himself back to the Lord at that time. That's the kind of man that John was. Uh, Jude Thaddeus, uh, he went to Armenia, Syria, and Arabia. There's an interesting legend of Abgar, the king of Edessa, who wrote to Jesus asking him to come, escape the Jewish mistreatment, and heal his affliction. Jesus apparently wrote back, according to the legend, that he could not come, but would send one of his disciples after he was taken up to heaven. After his ascension, Thomas uh, sent Thaddeus to Edessa. He preached the gospel and healed the king and many people. Now, we don't think of Jesus having letters written back in those days, but letters were written in those days, so it's, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, according to... Uh, one legend, Jude Thaddeus was killed by arrows and spears on Mount Ararat. Matthew, the brother of James the Younger, uh, he had a ministry to the Hebrews. 
and in northern Greece and uh, among the Syrians. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew no later than 60 AD. And his former education and employment as customs officer would have acquainted him with Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. There are many legends uh, about him ministering to kings and high government officials, so, and these make, make sense in the light of his background. Then uh, there is the apocryphal account that he was killed by cannibals. The Talmud says that he was condemned to death by the Sanhedrin. And there's other accounts of how he died as well. Matthias uh, replaced Judas. We see that in Acts 123. He would have been prominent among the 70. According to Luke 10.1, he would have gone out uh, in pairs of two. Jesus would have sent them out in, in pairs um, to, to go and preach the gospel. So he would have been one of those. Uh, there, Clement of Alexandria, the early Greek theologian, thought that Matthias was the Zacchaeus who got uh, in the tree to see Jesus. So, you know, who knows? These were just... Um, but Clement, actually, Clement lived in 96 AD, so he might not have been that far off. He didn't live too long after, you know, the, or no, excuse me, this is Clement of Alexandria, so he would have been a little bit later on than Clement of Rome. But still, it was early on, so he might have been right. Uh, Matthias had a ministry in Armenia, and uh, he returned to Jerusalem and was martyred uh, there, possibly by stoning. Peter, the brother of Andrew, well, of course, he had huge ministry in Corinth, uh, Antioch, Britain, and Rome. He was actually the, uh, the first bishop, if you will, of, of Antioch and then, and then of Rome. And uh, he withstood Simon Magnus, the magician uh, that we see in Acts chapter 8 uh, in Rome. And uh, Nero had Peter crucified upside down on Vatican Hill in 67 A.D., so you can see the, the picture there uh, of, the, of the cross, and he is, he is upside down on the cross. And that's how he was killed. Uh, he was the author of First and Second Peter. The Gospel of Mark is Peter's account of Christ. Actually, when you read the, the Gospel of Mark, it was, it was pretty much everything that Peter had told Mark over and over and over and over again uh, that Mark wrote down. Philip uh, had a ministry to Scythia, Hierapolis, and Gaul, which was, for, uh, in modern time, is known as France. He was possibly the cross in Hierapolis. The apocryphal Acts of Philip says he was pierced through the thighs while hanging upside down. Now, one thing to know about these names, when you, the names like James and Philip and Mary, they were so common. And there's so many of them, actually, there's many of them listed in Scripture, more than one, that sometimes, looking back, we aren't quite sure who did what. You know, we know that a Philip did a certain thing or, or whatever, but, um, you know, he, this Philip the Apostle did certain things, and Philip the Deacon did uh, other things as well. I talk about that in, in the book. But there is confusion between the Apostle and the Deacon. Simon the Canaanite, he went to Egypt, Numidia, Mauritania, Libya and other places. He also possibly went um, to Britain with Joseph of Arimathea. There's a legend that he went with Joseph there, preached the gospel. It is believed that then he traveled and ministered with Jude Thaddeus uh, in Syria, Mesopotamia, and as far as Persia, where he was martyred by being sawn asunder. You know the uh, Hebrews chapter 11 the end of it. It talks about the heroes of faith, you know, uh, you know, by faith, uh, by faith, by faith. They all did these things. And then at the end, it talks about those who died by faith. And one of them, it, or one portion, it mentions that some died by being sawn asunder. Could have very well been talking about Simon the Canaanite. Thomas Didymus, Thomas the twin. Uh, he had a ministry to Babylon, Syria, North and South India. There's a legend that Thomas found the three wise men in his travels and baptized them as Christians. They later were martyred in Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Probably not true, but interesting legend. Um, it is quite possible that Thomas established the first Babylonian church. Thus, 
what would be called the first bishopric. Uh, it would have been the first place possibly of, of authority uh, in that part of the world, the first bishopric. Now, what I want you to understand about Thomas is that he completely changed his character when he saw Jesus Christ uh, raised from the dead. And, you know, when Jesus looked at him and said, you know, uh, stick, your, stick your hand into my side, stick your fingers into the nail prints in my hand, it completely revolutionized his life. And he became a force to be reckoned with. He went to India and he started, uh, well, at least dozens of churches, if not hundreds of them. As a matter of fact, he started churches that still exist to this day. I've met people who, who belong to the group of Christians that go all the way back to the time of Thomas. That's pretty amazing. I mean, he, he ended up becoming a, an incredibly mighty man of God. And so, you know, once somebody's doubt is answered, once Jesus Christ gets into somebody's heart, you can just never tell what's going to happen to that individual. You know, that's what happened to Thomas. He became an amazing individual, uh, forced to be reckoned with. Now, there were other important early Christians we'll look at quickly here. Uh, Paul, of course, uh, Saul of Tarsus, an amazing individual. We could, people have spent, you know, 10 hours talking about Paul. He was, po he was probably converted 33 to 35 AD. Uh, the dates of his three missionary journeys may have been uh, the first one uh, from 46 to 48 AD. Uh, the second one from 51 to 53, and the third one from 54 to 58 A.D. He was imprisoned twice in Rome. Uh, some think he was only imprisoned once, but in reality, scholars say, no, historians say he was imprisoned twice. Uh, the, the end of the book of Acts was his first imprisonment, but then apparently he was released for a while, and he possibly uh, went to Spain. Clement of, of Rome writes, uh, it, around 96 AD that Paul preached in both the East and the West and to the extreme limit of the West, which at that time would have been known as Spain. Uh, he was beheaded in Rome on the same day Peter was crucified in 67 AD. So Nero had them both taken out in one day. This is pretty much established. I mean, this is at least tradition. It's not legend that in one day they were, they were both taken out. Peter was was hung upside down on the cross and Paul was beheaded. He is the author of numerous New Testament epistles and you know he just uh, changed many people's lives in his ministry. Barnabas, known as Joses, the son of encouragement, he was a Levite from Cyprus who moved to Jerusalem. Uh, the church first sent him to Cyprus, where he encouraged the new believers and helped found the church. We see that in Acts 11. In 45 AD, he and Paul were ordained for missionary work, and then he returned to Cyprus and was martyred in his native town of Salamis around 60 AD. His cousin and companion, John Mark, buried him. So John Mark was his cousin. Uh, once again, John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. Here we're talking about John Mark, also known as Mark. Uh, Peter considered him a spiritual son, which I thought was quite interesting. You can read about that in 1 Peter 5.13. Uh, perhaps Peter led him to the Lord. We, we don't know, but he considered him a spiritual son. He wrote the Gospel of Mark. Now, Eusebius says that Mark was the first to preach the Gospel in Alexandria. He was the first bishop to the Church of Alexandria. And he got martyred there. They finally didn't want to put up with his preaching. And so they literally tied a rope around his neck and drug him. And just drug him and drug him until you know, he was completely dead um, through all the rocks and everything else. His bones were taken to Venice where he is a patron saint today. Luke was a physician, uh, possibly a native of Antioch. He traveled extensively with Paul. He was Paul's sole companion for a period during Paul's second imprisonment at Rome. Luke was tight with Paul. Just like, just like Mark was tight with Peter, I want you to see that Luke was tight with Paul. And he was the author of the Gospel of Luke and the Acts 
of the apostles, the earliest uh, history of the church. Some say that, that when Paul is referring in the Gospels, or excuse me, in the New Testament, to his Gospel, that he's actually referring to Luke, because, because Luke got everything from Paul. Um, and he was, Paul was, or Luke was possibly crucified with Andrew. Mary Magdalene, uh, she, in your notes you can see, she has been called the apostle to the apostles since she took the news of Jesus' resurrection to the apostles. Um, she was from Magdala of Galilee. She was mislabeled as a prostitute. Many Christians are taught that, that she was a prostitute, but we, that's not really necessarily accurate. Um, if, if you look where they got that from, it's in, it's in the chapter preceding. Uh, it's talking about a prostitute, and then it starts talking about Mary Magdalene in the next chapter. Uh, she's the one from whom seven demons were cast out, or seven devils, or, or whatever. Um, so she's kind of been miscast that way. Now, Mary preached throughout Italy. Uh, excuse me, I missed this. Uh, she's confused with Mary, Lazarus' sister. A lot of confusion there, as we will see in, in this class. Mary preached throughout Italy. She is probably the Mary that Paul names in Romans 16.6, where it says, who labored much for us, quite possibly, because she was there in Rome at that time. Now, there is a tradition, a very strong tradition, that Mary took an egg to Emperor Tiberius in Rome as a symbol of new life in the resurrection. Uh, this had to happen around 30, before 37 AD because uh, Tiberius didn't live past that. Um, she, she said to Tiberius, Christ is risen. Now she must have been a woman of means and substance in order to even have an audience with Tiberius. But apparently she was. She said, Christ is risen and explained to the emperor about the life and resurrection of Christ. Um, Tiberius told her that resurrection from the dead was impossible, as impossible as her egg turning to the color red. Immediately, the egg began to turn red as a testimony to her words. This began the tradition of giving red paschal eggs at Easter. Now, this is simply a tradition, but I want you to understand that this goes all the way back to the second century in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So we're starting, we're talking way back in church history that they have had this red paschal egg tradition. Uh, whether the egg actually turned red or not, who knows? But miracles were happening, and, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, she was apparently a very bold lady uh, in order to do this. And um, then we look at Lazarus. One tradition in Cyprus says Lazarus went there in 60 AD um, where he became bishop of the uh, of Citium for, for 30 years. Uh, but there is also a strong tradition in Marseille, France, that Lazarus, his sister Mary and Martha, a servant named Marcella, and a disciple named Maximum to Marseille uh, uh, where Lazarus became bishop. Uh, the Brothers of Jesus, it's very interesting. If you um, look in your textbooks on, let's see where that's at, on page 24, I want you to see that um, I have quite a bit written there about them. There's a great controversy about the Brothers of Jesus, and I just want to read this, this beginning here. The characterization of their identities has caused controversy among the various um, Christian traditions. Uh, three different theories have been promoted based upon doctrinal viewpoint. Uh, they are the brother theory, the half brother theory, and the cousin theory. The first is held primarily by Protestants, the second by Eastern Orthodox, and the third by Roman Catholics. And below I have portrayed the brother theory as the most likely with an expansion following. So I'm not going to read through the, the life of James and Jude. You can read that on your own. James was an amazing individual. Uh, they both wrote books that are in the New Testament. But I want you to look down now at the bottom of page 25. Let us consider the three theories mentioned above. The expansion is somewhat complex but can be simplified 
into the following. The brother theory holds that Jesus was a blood brother with James, Jude, and the others through Mary. The half-brother theory states that Joseph was their father, but Mary was not their biological mother. Joseph brought his sons and daughters from a former marriage into his marriage with Mary. In the cousin theory, the siblings of Jesus are actually distant relatives. Their mother is called Mary, wife of Alphaeus, and is a sister to Mary, the mother of Jesus. This makes Jesus uh, a cousin to them. So let's kind of look at this now. The brother theory is held by Protestants. Uh, that would be us. It is exegetically the, and biblically the most natural and sound. Why? Well, the biblical Greek word brother means brother. <laughs> and um, Tertullian held this theory. The first century historian Josephus said James was Jesus' brother. Also, the children were often with Mary. I have scriptures listed there. Why would they be with Mary if they were older than Jesus and had a different mother? So it only makes sense that, that they actually were the brothers, you know, just like the Bible says. The only real objections to the brother theory are the following two. Number one, Mary would not be a perpetual virgin, eliminating that doctrine from the Roman and Eastern church. And number two, the fact that Jesus asked John to care for Mary rather than relying on his own family. Well, the simple answers to this are that John was his closest disciple. Um, Jesus emphasized spiritual relationship over a natural one. And his brothers were not yet believers. I mean, you can read that in John 7, 5. And so, you know, why is he going to put his, his mom with, with uh, his brothers who were not yet believers? Now, the half-brother and cousin theories were adopted by certain early church fathers in the zealous age that leaned towards celibacy, which we'll look at later. But Jerome promoted the cousin theory early in his career uh, quote, to save the virginity of both Mary and Joseph and to reduce their marriage relationship to a merely nominal and barren connection, uh, end quote. Yet later in his life, he was not so sure of this. Jerome kind of changed his mind. Today, the half-brother theory is held by Eastern Orthodox and the cousin theory by Catholics. The cousin theory is the one which proposes that Jesus' brothers were actually three of the apostles, James is James the Younger, son of Alphaeus, Jude is Jude Thaddeus, and Simon is Simon the Canaanite, or Zealot. So you can see how this confuses the student of history, because the Catholics have a different view, the, the, the Protestants have a different view, and the Eastern Orthodox. But Philip Schaeff, the famous historian, he says that, that these views are not right, the half-brother and the cousin theory, and he lists three reasons. He says, one, the words brother and cousin are both found in the New Testament. James and the others are called Jesus' brothers, not cousins. The authors knew the difference. Number two, Mary would have had a sister named Mary, <laughs> which seems unlikely. And number three, John 7, 5 says Jesus' brothers were not believers before the resurrection. Thus, they weren't apostles or disciples. How could they be apostles or disciples if they weren't even saved yet? Um, they could not have been listed among the 12. So this is clearly a contradiction. Now, one last thing um, before the break. Here's some other things to write down in, in the blanks there. This is regarding Simus Magnus, Simon Magnus, rather, the father of all heresy. Simon the magician, or also known as Simon the sorcerer, is listed there in Acts 8. 9 through 24. Now the Samaritans regarded him as the great power of God. Uh, he was called the father of all heresy by Arrhenius and Hippolytus, and he was called the originator of Gnosticism. A second century Samaritan Gnostic sect actually made Simon Magnus the redeemer rather than Jesus. Uh, Eusebius, the early church historian, says that Peter withstood him twice once in Samaria and then in Rome. It's very interesting because supposedly Peter uh, was there in Rome and, si and Simon uh, the magician uh, was, was refuting him. And so Peter prayed, well, Simon the magician, you know, this is, you know, there is some power in occultic practices. I mean, you can just read about Pharaoh's court to see some of the magicians doing certain things at that time. But, but apparently, according to legend, 
uh, Simon Magnus actually rose up in the air in power, like he kind of like was levitating uh, way up in the air. Well, well, Peter prayed and Simon came crashing to the ground and he died. And then finally, um, the Romans implored John Mark to write a summary of Peter's divine instruction instigating the creation of the Gospel of Mark. It was Mark who translated for Peter time and time and time again for years. And so Mark knew Peter's story so well that he put Peter's account into what was, has become known as the Gospel of Mark. Okay, and you can look at the timeline there, and we'll move into the next lesson uh, in the next hour. Let's take a break.